viewers, uh, we're starting uh, our program uh, critically uh, and freely uh, conducted by Gintotas Majekis and me, Thomas Kowalowskis from Vitotas Magnus University. Uh, we're senior researchers who are interested today to conduct a conversation with our special guest, uh, Niklas Bernsand from Lund University, Sweden, who is an expert uh, on uh, uh, Ukraine and uh, uh, he's a Slavist. And we would like to talk to him uh, today about geopolitical situation uh, in Europe, uh, Russian and Ukrainian um, tensions. However, we would like to start from a little bit of background history and certain divisions. So, Professor Gendotas, uh, would you like to ask uh, Nicholas uh, uh, the first question? Uh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, nice to see you, uh, Nicholas. And my uh, first question, you know, that uh, contemporary listeners of uh, media, as you know, ordinary uh, 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 accepts or, or rejects, you know, the idea of separation of Ukraine, you know. And ordinary, ordinary uh, Putinist propaganda says that, look, uh, there is uh, uh, West Ukraine and East Ukraine. Sometimes uh, he calls this uh, West Ukraine as Galicia, you know. But in any way, uh, how it's important uh, for contemporary, for history and contemporary Ukraine, this uh, separation of two parts? Yeah, thank you for, for your question. I will say that even also in, in, in Swedish media, that would be one of the most common stereotypes, so to speak, about, about Ukraine. If uh, people uh, know, know something about Ukraine, they will probably mention this, that you have Western Ukraine and then you have Eastern Ukraine. So if you allow me to start from a kind of a meta perspective and then evolve into a more factual aspect, right? Uh, I mean, in, in, in Ukraine, in Ukrainian studies and so on, uh, there has been much talk, obviously, during um, the last 30 years uh, about this division. Uh, some people have emphasized its existence, other people have said that it's really not such a big division. Uh, and, I mean, mo one of the most important starting points would be probably Nikola Rebchuk's article about two Ukraines from the 1990s something. Uh, and uh, well, we're claiming then that we have a Western Ukraine and we have an Eastern Ukraine. Then you had various answers to that. For example, uh, there, there was one, one answer that pointed out that uh, why not 22 Ukraines then? Because you can always find various kinds of division in any country uh, that, 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 you could, that, that you could define in such a way. Um, then if you remember already after the Orange Revolution, like 2004 or 5, uh, there were um, uh, some people claim that now this successful uh, revolution shows that uh, this talk, all this talk about uh, Eastern and Western Ukraine, it's, it's uh, an exaggeration in reality. Uh, there is one Ukraine with some differences, but there is one Ukraine. Then uh, quickly some other people began to, began, began to argue that after all we cannot ignore we cannot ignore the division. There is a division, but then again, and I think that's correct. I mean, there, there is there, there, you have real differences between various parts of Ukraine that sometimes are quite significant. Uh, one question you should start with is, is but, but what does that mean? If if you have Western Eastern Ukraine, you have to have some kind of a boundary. So where would that boundary be? And if you're talking in kind of political terms, if you look, for example, at how people have voted in the various presidential elections, parliamentary elections, you will see that there, that there is a certain moment uh, to, for example, to the uh, to e eastwards. For example. So, so if you believe in this clear division between the Western and Eastern Ukraine, then Western Ukraine has become somewhat bigger during those 30 years. So, um, so it, it, it's also a matter then of what, what would be Western Ukraine, and you could you could look at contemporary politics, or you can look at various historical points uh, and, and concepts uh, to define this. Uh, then again, you can ask yourself: Should uh, is Western Eastern Ukraine really the most relevant? Maybe you should look at, at at various regions inside, for example, Western Ukraine, where you have huge differences between, let's say, Galicia, as you mentioned, right? 
and, and then you have uh, uh, Zakarpatia, Transcarpatia. Uh, if, if you look, for example, to the extent that people in those regions vote for, uh, so to speak, national candidates in, in, in say, patriotic, to use a more neutral uh, word, uh, candidates in various presidential and, and, and parliamentary elections, you will see that in, in Galicia, people indeed would vote in the way you would expect it, right? Uh, and while in, in uh, Transcarpathia, it depends very much on, on, the, on the locality, in some parts people will vote, vote for the same candidates. In other parts, those candidates don't really have more support than they would have in what would be called Eastern Ukraine. So uh, there are big differences inside those kind of macro regions. Uh, the reason for um, that we, we, we talk about them or, or that they formed in, if we want to pick, pick, pick up some reality, uh, something specific about this is that, well, uh, different parts of Ukraine uh, form part of different empire, empires historically. And, and uh, uh, what we would habitually call Western Ukraine or the most specific regions were part of Poland, Lithuania, Poland, Austria, Hungary, and mostly Austria in the case of Transcarpatia, Hungary, right? Uh, and they, the, because of this, they had a certain kind of development. If you take Galicia, as mentioned, or Bukovina for that matter, uh, those regions never were controlled by, by, by Moscow. They were never governed by Moscow until uh, 1939, the autumn of 1939. Uh, and um, while, for example, another important region in what is now habitually Western Ukraine, which Volhynia, was indeed a part of the Russian Empire until 1918, then when it, after the First World War, it became, after all, all the wars and, and, and turbulence, it became a part of Poland, uh, which is important if you talk about national identities, conflicts, and, and, and how, how those things develop. Um, while Ukraine, to the east of a certain uh, of, of a certain line was uh, part of the Russian Empire, it was part of the Tsarist Empire um, until the, the revolution, and, and in, in many cases continuously, uh, with the exceptions of the revolutionary years, maybe where you had chaos and different efforts of state building. So um, I, I think the divisions are rooted historically in various state belongings, which brought with them different preconditions for, for example, the creation of a national movement. It was easier to develop, uh, say, um, an infrastructure for, uh, in support of the Ukrainian language, Ukrainian activism, ethnic activism in Austria than it was in Russia. So we had a lot of, uh, say, uh, interreferences between those regions, but I think that would be one of the reasons, at least. Yeah, Nicholas, you understand that this uh, question is important uh, because, you know, um, Russia declares that uh, if the military conflict will start, they would like to take uh, the eastern part. You know, ordinarily they consider this eastern part as not only Donbass, but as well Dnepropetrovsk or Dnepro now or Kharkov you know, or even South Ukraine, uh, Odessa, you know, they uh, uh, consider it so-called East Bank of Dnieper, yeah. you know, uh, or, uh, and the question is, you know, is really this part uh, uh, Eastern, I mean, Eastern in Russian sense that uh, Eastern for them means pro-Russian, you know. Ah. Well, I mean, there are, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. There are various ways of, 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 of starting to explain this. Uh, if you, for example, talk about uh, pro-Russian as, as a very explicit kind of Russian nationalist support, then that has been low historically in those regions. Even in Crimea, uh, such parties before 2014 got no more than about 10% of the vote. Like the Ruski bloc, for example, in, in Crimea. Uh, in Donbass, uh, they got even less. I don't remember the exact numbers, but but significantly uh, less than they, they got in Crimea. And uh, the support in other the other provinces that you mentioned uh, were negligible. There were no active Russian separatism, pro pro Russian separatism in those regions before 2014. Um, I would say that. Um, in, in in those regions, in, in, in Donbass and in, in those parts of Donbass, which is still controlled by Ukraine, 
uh, you will find certain elements of, uh, of, of certain pro-Russian sentiments among the population, or at least uh, some kind of hesitation uh, about about the Ukrainian state, about, about the Ukrainian authorities, the Ukrainian army, and so on. Uh, it's difficult for me to say exactly how widespread it is, but it certainly is there, and it's it's, it's massive enough, I, I, I would say. Uh, in other regions, you would have, you will find uh, different attitudes, but I would say my understanding is that there that there there is no mass level sympathy for uh, some kind of affiliation with Russia. Uh, of, of of any kind that would be relevant for the present situation in, say, uh, Odessa, Kharkiv, Dnipro, and, and so on. Uh, I mean, um, uh, because we, I mean, we are after the annexation of Crimea and and and, and after the events in Donbas. I mean, the war in Donbas. Uh, being pro-Russian is not an abstraction. I mean, before 2014, we could have talked about it to some different levels. You can be pro-Russian in various ways, but when you Asked about being pro-Russian now, it means that you would have sympathy for the Russian state that is conducting this, those very policies. And you will, you will not talk about sympathies for the Russian language. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about a, a certain view of the past where you would be more or less in line with various old Soviet versions. I'm not talking about that. Being pro-Russian now would be uh, to be in support more or less, or being okay with being neutral to even uh, the activities of the Russian state today. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, in that sense, I don't believe that you would find some kind of majority support for this in in, in those provinces. Uh, thank you. That uh, accusation of Moscow for Ukraine is in fascism. You know that ordinary uh, when we are looking to. Uh, uh, Russian channels, including uh, highest representatives and Putin, ordinary they accuse, if not all Ukrainians, a part of them into fascism or sympathy to fascism, and uh, they uh, do references uh, uh, to the Bandera or so-called Banderovce. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, you know that this is uh, quite important to explain for. Lithuanian and Baltic people, because you know we understand differently that Banderovts, uh, because for example, Lithuania, so-called Green Brothers, or if you will take, uh, for example, Serbs or Croatia, it's Ustasha, Chetniks. Everywhere was not so simple, you know. Uh, how do you explain this phenomenon of uh, Banderovts? How it's important for the Western Ukraine or Ukrainian identity, or j- is this just uh, some uh, Kremlin sphere, you know, Kremlin's uh, imaginary? I mean, it's it, it's all it's all of those things, I suppose. I mean, in uh, uh, the phenomenon, the phenomenon grew out of uh, conditions in 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 Western Ukraine. You know, basically ethnic strife. Uh, but in in Poland, between the Polish government and uh, and, uh, and and Ukrainian nationalists, um, a lo- large part, at least, of Ukrainian society, that part of that choose not to uh, emphasize civil relations and this is a democratic participation, but to fight to fight in other ways. So from that surround surroundings and and from uh, other kinds of diaspora activities. Uh, those organizations uh, gradually uh, took form, and uh, there were military action already in the uh, earlier in, in, the, in this way. Uh, after the, the outbreak of the Second World War, uh, after the uh, Soviet invasion uh, of Poland, of, of, of the Ukrainian and Belarusian provinces, of, after and after the Nazi attack on the Soviet Union, of course, uh, those activities intensified. In various ways, and and uh, um, those units, uh, by some Ukrainians, local Ukrainians, came to be seen as uh, defenders of, say, Ukrainian peasants against, for example, Soviet collectivization or Soviet uh, Soviet authorities. Uh, simultaneously, they took part in various atrocities. And you can say crimes. Um, and they, there were involvement of, of of some of those units in, in the Holocaust. In the kill, this this is not an invention by Putin. It's true. There were involvement of of, of those units in 
the ethnic cleansing of Poles in Volhynia into 42-43. So, so that that actually happens. So, so the units are problematic from from from, from a historical perspective. Um, on the other hand, um, this is of course maximally used by the Russian side uh, to point to to pinpoint any kind of Ukrainian. Uh, independent independentism basically as uh politically morally hesitant more morally doubtful um and and, and they, they play this card maximally and they often do they often exaggerate uh in ukraine i would say that this is an important memory for some it's a regionally an important memory it's uh if you, for example, look at opinion polls, and you, 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 if you look at, at memories of Holodomor, the big famine in the 1930s, you can see that gradually there seemed to be a kind of uh, unification uh, when where Eastern Ukrainian public opinion are closing up with Western, Western and Central Ukrainian political opinions. Uh, when it comes to Bandera, it's not that clear. You still have a regional tendency that this is important for many people, not all obviously, but many people in Western, in the Western parts, uh, meaning basically mostly Galicia and Volhynia, but most importantly, because that's where most of the fighting took place. Uh, while th there's been some positive, some changes in direction of more positive attitudes in uh, Eastern and Southern parts, but not to the same extent. And there is still, I think, a great, degree of hesitancy uh, about those figures in in eastern ukraine uh, so i think in western ukrainian memory culture uh, in official memory culture for example those uh, her heroes that we for them play a significant role if you go to lviv you will see and you you go to the center from the railway station you look to the right and like in two minutes you have a huge you can a bandera statue for for example, would be one of the first things you see if you know where to look. Just one example. I don't hear you. Uh, your mic. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's uh, go to more contemporary uh, contemporary issues. You know about uh, uh, new challenges. It's about Maidan first of all. You know that uh, from the one side, Maidan, uh, I mean European, the first Maidan 2004, and the second uh, Maidan 2013 and 14, so-called Euro Maidan, uh, became some symbol of, uh, you know, uh, Ukrainian independence, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like Saudis in Lithuania, you uh -huh. know, that's, uh, I would say uh, that uh, very uh, similar symbols. You know, and ordinary many of groups try to privatize this memory of uh, Maidanian, you know, mm -hmm. uh, revolution. And then uh, many of political contemporary political parties uh, would like uh, to, uh, you know, to uh, to use this instrument for the pressure on the Rada or the government. Try mm -hmm. to sometimes to organize. Mm -hmm. some uh, nationalist uh, movements and uh, we could understand uh, sometimes that it's uh, a, a, some sort of instability in uh, in Ukraine because and this instability as well is uh, you know uh, sometimes could be explained by the spirit of Maidan but is it really this protests you know or Maidanian activism is it really the weakness of Ukraine or uh -huh. it's like democracy or uh -huh. development of contemporary democracy. How do you think about it? Well, I mean, it's it's uh, you can look at it uh, in both ways. Uh, I think obviously, maybe the first thing uh, that should be said here for the context is that uh, what happened to um, what what happened after uh, the change of government in early 2014. Uh, when uh, the war in Donbass broke out and so on. That, that there was um, indeed a huge uh, gathering of those forces that you mentioned in, in Kiev at that time. And they, of course, potentially could have uh, put a lot of weight and pressure on, on the various institutions in Kiev. 
uh, say corrupt institutions, institutions with a lot of people who you can say have, have limited credibility in the new situation. Uh, then the war broke out, and, and one of the things that happened was was that a lot of those activists, especially the most the strongest ones, the, the young males, um, people ready to fight, they le left Kiev and moved to the front. Many of them died on the front, among the first people to die. Uh, so in a way, in a way, when when the war started, this energy that you basically are talking about. Uh, was diffused to, to, to some degree by the actual war. So here you have an immediate connection between the uh, weakening of revolutionary energy and the uh, Russian uh, annexation of military policies, right? Uh, so that's, I, mean, I think, here you have, uh, that's all, also a part of the game. But to, to, Crimea is not only Crimea, and Donbass is not only Donbass. Um, then once again, of course, in a situation where, I mean, at first, I mean, what were the situation? I mean, the Ukrainian army was not what was not in a good shape. You probably remember, right? So what happened was that Ukraine was basically armed from below, to some extent from below, to some extent from oligarchs and from private pockets of those guys. Oligarchs who had also deep personal interests in in financing uh, effective forces to stop 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 these rebellions. Um, and uh, there were, I remember living in Ukraine in like in 2015-16, everywhere in churches and in other places you had, uh, there were collecting of money for the army and to a very, to, to a large extent the Ukrainian army was put up from below by, by civil society. Uh, and also in the start, a lot of the most effective battalions were not officially part of the Ukrainian army, they were kind of voluntary battalions, some of them uh, with some some, some political uh, um, inclinations that have been controversial, uh, and I mean this is then basically with time most of those formations became incorporated in the Ukrainian army. But still, if you have this situation with comparatively weak institutions, and you have a, a, a situation where uh, many uh, people, men and women, have experience from the front and can be frustrated with what they would see maybe as defeatist positions or as, uh, uh, say, it could be corruption, it could be various things. Then uh, those people have actual experience uh, using money, and you can also perhaps see that in some cases maybe you can you can find some, you know, chains of financing that also would be relevant for the larger political games. Um, then it's it, it's not that easy to say is, is is this a strength or is it a weakness? In a way, it's a weakness because Ukraine needs better institutions. Ukraine needs better functioning institutions. In that case, in, from that perspective, it's definitely a weakness. On the one, on, on the other hand, uh, the only thing that have, that has uh, propelled uh, corrupt bureaucracies and uh, um, well uh, dormant. Uh, civil servants, uh, government officials, to do something has been the threat of the street gathering, right? So in that sense, it's also a potential. So it's both a threat, I think, and a potential. That's a uh, maybe a, a vague answer, but I think you have to keep both options in mind. Would you would you agree, Nicholas, that? Uh... Uh, Maidan and Euro Maidan at first, then then um, Maidan uh, revolution was uh, in 2014 actually the the shifting point when Ukraine geopolitically shifts towards uh, European Union uh, to the west uh, away from from Russia, talking geopolitically, and uh, ever since ever since Russia um, has been. Uh, uh, trying to uh, organize these um, regional military conflicts in order to create Ukraine as a what uh, Jacques Rupnik would call failed state or failing democracy state, uh, uh, unstable, therefore uh, incompetent to become a NATO member, incompetent to become a, a EU member, uh, therefore uh, creating something uh, like uh, never completed transformation to full democracy uh, is beneficial for Russia uh, and it, this has been the politics 
uh, ever Perfect. since Maidan. Uh, would you agree with that uh, concept that uh, Ukraine uh, is the target for Russia as a failed state? Uh -huh. I, I see. I see your point. To begin with, uh, well, I mean, indeed, uh, the, the, the the say the victory of the Maidan was uh, uh, was a big step in 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 moving Ukraine uh, more clearly to the west. That's that's obvious. The second big step was, of course, Russia's actions. I mean, uh, there was never a clear majority among Ukrainian citizens for joining NATO, for example, until until Russian annexation of Crimea and, 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 and the outbreak of war in Donbass. I mean, in that sense, you have, okay, you have the Maidan, yes, but you also have uh, the war, the war in, in, in Donbass. And uh, in this way, Russia itself created uh, the uh, Ukraine that really seeks no other alternatives but the West. Before uh, 2013, I mean, 14, it would have been difficult to convince a lot of Ukrainians of the necessity of joining uh, of, of jo joining NATO. Now, now, now people would, would see that we have uh, we, we have no choice. So um, it's created by this turn has been created by the change of elites uh, after the victory of, of, of the Maidan and uh, by uh, the policies of the aggression of Russia, which has forced uh, Ukraine to uh, to seek protect protection uh, where they can find protection, if they can find if they can find protection, we should that. Then uh, I think you are right that it's it's in the interest of of, of uh, Russia now to project an image of Ukraine as a failed state. Uh, it also in the interest of Russia that Ukraine Ukraine actually would be as weak as possible. Um, and 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 I mean. Uh, I, I yes, basically I agree with you that, that this is this is uh, this is indeed in that interest. However, if uh, the war starts, I don't know to what extent um, you accept uh, the degree of danger now that uh, the world leaders are talking about the Russian army is at the borders of Ukraine. Um, in any case. Um, the threat is there, and uh, if the war starts, then uh, the perpetrator becomes uh, more than obvious for for the yes. uh, for us. For us, it's been obvious uh, ever yes. since uh, uh, Maidan. But however, for the uh, some naive uh, Westerners, uh, the perpetrator yes. would become way too obvious. Um, would, wouldn't that be something uh, against Russia? Is what is your interpretation in case Russia does decide to invade Ukraine, uh, like full full screen? Um, wouldn't it be uh, against the Kremlin's uh, all the intentions? Because uh, then uh, Russia would be uh, uh, singled out like uh, like an obvious uh, evil maker. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but if, if Russia does invade, then of course it's it's all cards on the table. So, uh, but I mean, if if Russia if Russia would choose to invade, then they have already stopped caring about what people think. I mean, that they they, they they would already be past that point. Uh, so they would then consider uh, that military means would be to their interest. Uh, whatever would happen in terms of economic sanctions, uh, cut off from SWIFT or. Uh, uh, you know, problems for the Nord Stream pipeline if that would happen, as the new German government says it might, might, might be the case. Uh, so if, if they choose to invade, they have left, I think they would have left all such considerations uh, behind, behind. Yeah. We, many of us, we imagine a very classical uh, form of uh, Warfare, you know, that's uh, Second uh, World War, front lines, you know, tanks, battalions, you know. Uh, this, uh, it looks like uh, from old uh, fairy tale because uh, contemporary mm -hmm. Russian aggressions, if you will take uh, uh, Georgia, Sakartvelia, or uh, the, you know, this uh, 
uh, Donbassian uh, case, you mm -hmm. know, all this aggression looks completely differently. It's not about yeah. front line. It looks like a very dirty, you know, a human uh, hybrid with human resources, money, corruption, you know, mm -hmm. uh, creation of uh, civic chaos, you know, development of this civic chaos. Uh, and uh, how do you think about this possibility, not about military aggression, which is, uh, you know, many of uh, European politicians think about it, but about this organizing of uh, chaos in some yeah. parts of Ukraine as some element of uh, warfare. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I think basically those things are happening. Uh, all the time, I suppose. There, I mean, there, there are constant. Uh, of course, R R Russia tries to influence the Ukrainian Ukrainian society in in, in various ways. Uh, and of course, um, what happened during the so-called Russian Spring uh, was that the, 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 the that I mean, the so-called Russian Spring indeed was exactly that kind of manipulations. They succeeded in in the Donbas. They succeeded in Crimea. They failed in Kharkiv. They failed in Dnipro. They failed in Odessa, and so on. Uh, so. I think indeed that, uh, that 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 would be some kind of alternative, but uh, would they, I mean, um, I doubt that they would be very successful without the support from uh, from um, armed forces of Russia, because in this time, you know, uh, this is not 2014. People have seen what has become uh, with the so-called uh, people's republics in, in in the east right and that's not uh dreamland for many people uh that's not the situation maybe where you would like to find yourself your street your city your family and so on right so uh, i think the actual events of 2014 and the war that has been after that do not really show that as a kind of successful independent strategy. I would imagine that in connection with the Russian invasion, they would do, do various kinds of uh, of sabotage and disturbances. Uh, absolutely. But uh, not uh, maybe not as an independent strategy at, at this age. That would be my guess. Yeah, I think so. The same. Uh, like uh, sabotage could be used as military instrument, you yeah. know, uh, chaos and sabotage. It's uh, it, it's quite understandable, but uh, look about uh, uh, Western countries, you know, uh, and their solidarity with Ukraine. Uh -huh. Ordinarily, they would like to solidarize only on this front line. I, I think, oh, okay, the ordinary say looks uh, uh, military troops of Russia on the borders of Ukraine. You see the new dangerous attack and so on. But ordinary, when uh, we start uh, to discuss some chaos in some regions of Ukraine, we accuse this uh, Ukrainian government. We say that you don't see uh, possibilities. You couldn't, uh, you uh, find, uh, you know, um, means how to uh, regulate your civic life, and so this is. Uh, it looks like you know that. Uh, Western countries uh, and maybe in Ukraine are not ready to collaborate on the civic level, I would say, uh, in order to develop some civic security in this dangerous or more threatful regions, you know. Uh, and ordinary pays the only uh, uh, attention to the this military issue, you know when uh, Russia pays more attention to organizing of sabotaging civic chaos. Yeah, it's, it, 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 might, it might be the case. I think there's, there's much to say about various Western attitudes and the, 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 the actions of various European countries. Germany, I would probably say, to, 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 in, in, in the first hand. It, it, can, be, it, it can be the case, I, uh, to my knowledge, the most important actor in that respect would be the Ukrainian civil society. There is a lot of activities, a lot of um, that has been since 2014 in uh, the on the front line in the areas close to the front front in in in, in those parts of eastern Ukraine. A lot of of, of people uh, moving in from other parts of of Ukraine to take part in various supporting activities and and, and so on. Some of that. 
uh, might be supported by by various European uh, money, European European sources. But I think you may you, you may you, you may be right about that. Um, I think the most uh, the most dangerous for Ukraine in this regard are probably where when the uh, real politic of, of of certain European countries. Uh, come into conflict with declarations of support for Ukraine. I mean, the Nord Stream pipeline would, it should be the most obvious example, I suppose. Yeah, because, you know, many of us, we consider that uh, uh, some Western countries, not only Western countries, but even from the so-called uh, uh, Warsaw, uh, you know, camp, this uh, group, you know, of uh, Central Eastern European yes. countries, not always are united about some uh, questions, you know, and some of them could uh, even support Nord Stream 2, as for example, like in Lithuania with this endless conflict with Belarus Kali in mm -hmm. Belarus, because uh, when Lithuania would like to stop on the EU level, you know, some of countries ordinary block uh, uh, these all solutions, you know, because they have an interest in the uh, income in the profit, you know, and Nord Stream has as well uh, interest in profit. And this profit interest uh, means that uh, the uh, Western countries, uh, it, it's easy to buy some Western countries, you know, than yeah. to fight. And this uh, corruption, uh, what uh, does it mean for the Ukraine fate, for the, the Ukraine destiny? Well, I, I think I think it's it's uh, it's wor worrisome. Um, uh, firstly, I mean, I, th I suppose you are talking about Hungary, for example, in 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 that case. I mean, uh, the Hungarian government have. The, 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 they, there have been various utterances during the years from the Ukrainians, from the Hungarian side about uh, Zakarpatia, about uh, the Hungarian minority there, and uh, there have been some fears of, of, of Hungarian interest in those regions and so on, and uh, some doubts about what, what, what would what would happen in, in case of and so on. Uh, so I think you have that problem. But on the other hand, you know, uh, this is related to this general conflict inside the European Union when. Poland and Hungary, and recently most clearly Poland, has shown that they would emphasize their own independence before the decisions of 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 of, of, of uh, uh, common of associated to the EU EU decisions. Uh, and then in that case, uh, sometimes we hear the argument from kind of centrist European forces that that. Uh, uh, Hungary and Poland and so on are risky, uh, are, are behave, behave in a risky way because they undermine the unity of the European Union, for example, in, in, in the face of a common Russian threat. Uh, which, I mean, there would be some, point, some, point, some points here regarding Hungary, maybe. Regarding Poland, I think not. Uh, but on the other hand, if you look at uh, what's really happening, uh, the most important thing here is is Nord Stream, and it's it, it, it and the main actor here, of course, is Germany. So uh, even if Hungary and Poland behaved perfectly, coordinated everything with Brussels and Strasbourg, uh, you still wouldn't have the, the, this kind of common front because it's undermined by by German business. Uh, so um, I, I think you one could also take that perspective. Uh, I'm so eager, uh, Nicholas, to ask you uh, at the book question here in Lithuania, um, which is the question of Crimea. Uh -huh. uh, in uh, Lithuanian media and um, uh, on the top uh, uh, official level, uh, it is unequivocally evil thing that um, Crimea has been occupied uh, since 2014, taken away from uh, uh, Ukraine and the sovereignty, uh, uh, unity of uh, sovereign country of Ukraine has been uh, violated. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, uh, 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 keeping in mind that uh, uh, certain political, uh, cultural uh, uh, behavior uh, would not be imagined uh, somewhere in Ukraine, like in Galicia, for example, yeah. to celebrate uh, May 9th as the victory day uh, in Galicia, there would be no such celebration. Uh, 
in Crimea, people do celebrate uh, this military uh, celebration of uh, uh, Victory Day against fascism, in particular against fascism. And uh, uh, for instance, when um, uh, train uh, tracks uh, were made from St. Petersburg all the way to Sevastopol, uh, mm -hmm. people were dancing on the streets uh, uh, <laughs> with uh, Soviet military uniforms, uh, uh, wearing all the medals uh, that they are connected with the mainland of Russia. And uh, I wonder to, to what extent uh, the population in Crimea uh, is uh, actually satisfied being a part of Russia. Of course, I do understand that uh, uh, Kremlin most likely invested much more into Crimea at the beginning of occupation in order uh, to, to make uh, the image uh, for itself as a caring, as a caring Kremlin, uh, uh, ignoring perhaps the needs of other Russian regions, mm -hmm. uh, investing into Crimea as a kind of a resort, uh, exclusive resort region. Uh, perhaps now the, there are much less investments. However, there is the bridge. Uh, there's uh, the, the train now direct to St. Petersburg. What do you think about uh, uh, the, the actual facts there in Crimea? Because uh, we do understand that this is a violation of international law. But um, looking at this, not from that perspective, uh, but uh, what is inside there, isn't it really a reconnection with the with the mainland? Uh, basically, I think what you're you're, you're asking me about the, the the public opinion in Crimea, how how, how people in Crimea uh, look uh, look at this. It's it's difficult for me to say. I mean, it's it's not um, it's not a situation where it is easy to conduct credible opinion polls. Uh, you know, uh, what, what um, uh, actually uh, not so long time ago I read uh, an article. Uh, it was a, res a researcher from, from America who uh, made opinion polls in Crimea in 2011, a few years before all, all those events. And he, f he found uh, a certain support for unification uh, with Russia. Then that was a very hypothetical question, right? Uh, among ethnic Russians of Crimea. Uh, no support at all among uh, Crimean Tatars. Crimean Tatars are almost 100% against connections with Russia. Many of them have, have fled to mainland Ukraine. Many live in, in, in Lviv and in Kyiv right now. And uh, the Tatar opinion is absolutely anti-Russian, to, to my knowledge. Uh, this is about uh, some something like 12-15% of the population uh, in Crimea after. That's the amount of people that have returned from uh, the, the place, Central Asia, to which they, they were deported in the 1940s. Uh, the Ukrainian community in that in that um, survey uh, was divided. Uh, most people were not in favor uh, of, of 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 some kind of unification with Russia. Uh, so I, I I would imagine that, uh, I mean, as I said before, there was no active political separatism on a very significant level in uh, 2013-14. It was not that people just sat in their homes and waited for Russia to take over. But, I mean, you had a certain amount of, of, of local local people, mostly Russians to some extent, some of the Ukrainians, who who might might have looked favor, favorably if, you know, if, if Russia, or might have believed also that Russia would mean uh, better pensions, uh, better quality of life, more roads, better roads, uh, and so on and so on. So situationally, I mean, uh, there might have been some support, although it's absolutely impossible to say to what extent that is. Afterwards, as you had said, there were initially a lot of investment, the bridge you mentioned, and a lot of other things, um, much less so now, as you said. Um, you, should, you should not forget also that um, there is a large amount of pressure, Basically, everyone has been forced to accept Russian citizenship. If you if you didn't accept, it, you would risk you would risk being uh, stripped of your property, for example, your house or your whatever whatever it was. Um, so okay, they have 
uh, train connection to St. Petersburg. But on the, one, on the other hand, you cannot fly to Europe. You can only fly to Russia. Earlier, you could fly to various countries, and you, can, you cannot anymore. Uh, and uh, there, there are also practical minuses. And secondly, water. Uh, Crimea is dependent upon water supplies from uh, Khersonsk Oblast in Ukraine. So, so, and Ukraine obviously doesn't feel that it has the obligation to provide uh, this annexed territory with water. Uh, so, um, there will be practical pluses and minuses also for, for the inhabitants of Crimea now. But I don't dare to speculate on, on, on the actual opinion, uh, except for the Crimean Tatars, that, that case is absolutely clear. It's, yeah, on, on the other hand, uh, Crimea has become, uh, especially keeping in mind uh, military seaport Sevastopol, uh, uh, that now uh, there's so much tension in the Black Sea between uh, uh, NATO forces and Russia, and we had uh, not too long ago this um, incident with the British Navy. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you see... Uh, 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 Crimea now uh, turning its image perhaps from uh, uh, exclusive resort territory into uh, geopolitical strategic uh, kind of uh, big castle for, for Russia um, to position its navy uh, fighting for the influence in the Black Sea because we have Turkey on the other coast we have uh, uh, Romania and Bulgaria, NATO countries on the other coast. Uh, it seems like there's a, a big battle, uh, especially if to compare to the Baltic Sea, uh, there would be some differences, I think. What, 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 do, what do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, the, ever since the Russian takeover of Crimea in 1783, uh, I mean, I mean uh, and, 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 and continuing in the 19th century, you had this dual aspect. On the one hand, uh, the military factor was there, I mean, the military base in Sevastopol was, uh, is, is from Tsarist times. Uh, and also during, um, uh, f f between the end of the Soviet Union and 2014, Russia had, as you said, uh, this, this, na this naval base, and the naval base had this function that you mentioned already back then. But on the other hand, um, also starting from Tsarist times, you have this image of Crimea as a resort, uh, as, a par as a paradisic place uh, for, for uh, uh, people who own country houses there and so on. Uh, and that also continued during Soviet times and uh, during uh, the, the first decades of, of, of Ukrainian independence. Uh, so I will say, especially in this situation, uh, I mean, obviously the military aspects predominates. It cannot be otherwise. Since the situation is kind of intense, it's not resolved. Uh, and and uh, uh, the NATO forces are, are have, have to show some presence in order not to not, not to mark uh, this this maritime territory as kind of a Russian interest interest. So so in, in the present situation uh, and also keeping in mind that I mean, for example, Western tourists will not go to Crimea. Some went to Crimea earlier, but that doesn't happen now. Crimea is shut off from this. So in that case, it's kind of inevitable that the military aspects to take the upper hand, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, perhaps uh, the Professor Mujekis would like uh, to ask uh, one more question before I ask the last question for our meeting. Yeah, because uh, we are talking about uh, Crimea and uh, Thomas mentioned Turkey's uh, position and uh, you mentioned about uh, Crimea Tatars, you know, and uh, now I uh, know that Kiev uh, would like to play some uh, games with Turkey uh, regarding to uh, Crimea uh, future, you know. Mm -hmm. This not uh, all these games are not uh, clear, but uh, as I understand, uh, Crimea is uh, uh, Kiev uh, looking for the, some coalition, more more or less strong uh, military coalition, and uh, they are search, searching for the solution of Crimea question. Because if we will react uh, on the your answer when Thomas question, we could uh, think that okay, all the problems are solved now. It's uh, completely Russia territory. 
but it's not. It looks uh, that it's not so, you know, because uh, Tatars would like the another solution. Uh, Kiev would like as well, and uh, we see new uh, player. It's Turkey. What's your opinion about Turkey and Tatars and Turkey interests about Crimea? I mean, for, from from the Tatars' perspective, the the, the idea is that uh, f for them, the first the first real difficult blow in it was the deportation in 1944 was almost every single Tatar was deported mostly to Uzbekistan right and they wasn't allowed to return until the late 1980s uh, and then 2014 will be the second blow uh, so so in in that case as far as I understand we have this axis of, of Ukraine and, and and the Crimean Tatars and also all already in the 1990s in the 2000s uh, the Crimean Tatars were the best ally for Kiev in, in, in Crimea, not the local Ukrainian community, but the uh, the Crimean Tatars, because they had common interests. Call it double post-colonialism or, or whatever you would like, uh, because they, 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 had, they had common interests. In that. And after uh, the annexation, uh, the communities, uh, exiled communities of Tatars in Lviv and uh, Kiev uh, worked very strongly with Ukraine. Uh, and Ukraine tries to take into account uh, Tatar interest and the Tatar factor when they are talking about the situation abroad. Remember that Kiev sent uh, the Jama Jamala, the singer, for example, to the Eurovision in 2016. But just w one example, I can also tell you my impressions living in Lviv for, for, for a long time, a few years ago, that uh, if you have like two refugee groups in the cities, you have the Crimean, Crimean Tatars, on the one hand, then you have Russians and Ukrainians, Russian speakers from Donbass. Uh, with one of those group, the groups, the relations were excellent, and I think they still are, that's with the Tatars. The Tatars are cons were considered friends of Ukrainians. People massively went to their cafes, their, their, their restaurants, and tried to support Tatars as best as they could. Uh, there were, I remember, tat exhibitions about Tatars in the local historical museums in, 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 in the Galicia. And, for example, uh, while there were some animosity occasionally with uh, people coming in from the Donbass uh, who were accused of you know, buying up the apartments and whatever you want. And uh, at the center here, obviously, is this feeling of loyalty. The Tatars are loyal the, and we have common interests, while the people from Donbass may be different, different kinds of people. Uh, and and um, as, as, and I think that, that in, in terms of uh, uh, Ukrainian Tatar alliance, that alliance is alive and kicking. Um, what would happen in the case of a miraculous Russian retreat from Crimea? It's difficult to say. If you look at, for example, at, at, at the memory loss of 2014, you can see that um, uh, there has been this, this official change of toponymy. Uh, and of course, Ukraine does not control Crimea at the moment, but uh, you, you, you can see that, that a lot of place names in Crimea, uh, Russian Soviet, were uh, changed back into Tatar names, for example. So that would give, give some uh, implications of how this alliance looks at this certain stage. What would happen in case of, of, of a real Ukrainian return of Crimea? It's difficult to say. Turkey, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on Turkey. As far as I understand, Turkey, Turkey considers itself a big regional player, not only on that front, but also in the Caucasus, in the Middle East, in Syria, and so on. And they have relate, difficult relations with Russia on all those fronts, right? So then uh, Crimea would, would be yet another vector, and it's more like a passive vector, as far as I see. It's not, I mean, there is a moral support, you know, you have since the 19th century, you have a large Crimean Tatar community in, in uh, Turkey, something like 150,000 if you count only the most intense circle, right? If you talk about people, Turks who have some degree of ancestry will have probably millions of people. Uh, so, I mean, you, you have this factor, but um, there, may, there, there are like um, some factors that are um, keeping Russia and uh, Turkey in, in some kind of strategic partnership, and there are some factors that would keep them as com competitors. And I think it, it, it's difficult to see uh, right in this, uh, in the, at this moment, that the Crimean, that, that Turkey could do so much with Crimea. 
that would have to be further in the future when other things already happen in the Caucasus and in Syria. I yeah, remember. but uh, Nicholas, uh, here what was uh, in your answer, I just uh, would like to repeat for our listeners that uh, there are uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, Crimea Tatars uh, now in uh, Turkey and they have uh, completely right for their, you know, neighbor lands or for their history, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. they are looking as well for the uh, you know, for the historical justice, uh, I would say, and uh, yeah. they are not uh, happy from all, all this, what's, what, what is going, and ordinary when we accept that Crimea, it's uh, then uh, uh, that all the questions are just uh, is solved about Crimea, no at all. It's not. Uh, be yeah, because there are very big uh, groups of uh, Tatars, you know, in different countries, especially in Ukraine, and Turkey, uh, who pretend uh, to return back, you know, to the, the uh, lands of their uh, ancestors. I thank you, Thomas, please. Uh, I would like to ask uh, the last question before we end our program today. Uh, uh, you, uh, you are teaching in Sweden and uh, a very um, kind of, uh, to some extent, exotic uh, uh, oh, yeah. subject Ukrainian studies. Uh, what are your students? Uh, uh, I mean, who, uh, I'm sorry, who are your students? Uh -huh. And uh, what uh, what seduces a Swedish student? Perhaps it's a multicultural group, maybe it's not uh, Swedish only. Uh, what seduces them to take uh, uh, studies into uh, Ukrainian studies, uh, probably under a large umbrella of Slavic studies. Mm. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm shifting slightly on the advice of uh, Professor Majekis. What is the Nordic perspective? How do you see from the other side of the Baltic Sea that uh, part of uh, uh, Europe, Eastern European uh, world, Ukraine? Uh -huh. Well, I mean, starting uh, with a smaller perspective, which is my courses, uh, then you can say that you know, we have one course now about Ukraine and Belarus uh, together, and, and here we have we have a, a certain number of students um, uh, open also for international students. It, it, it's held in English, so uh, we have mostly Swedish students. We have one woman from Estonia, for example, and we have one one woman from Germany. Uh, but basically, we have Swedish students. Then we have another course, uh, generally about memory politics in the post-Soviet states, uh, including then Russia, then Central Asia, and the Caucasus. And here we have we have some. We have a guy from Georgia, for example, and we have a girl from Russia. So we have, uh, apart from the Swedish students. Uh, so the, you, you're right that we have a more kind of multicultural audience in that sense. Um, well, people take. This course, those courses for various reasons, mostly uh, see them as add-ons to what I already have. They maybe they have some kind of political science uh, as a major or uh, uh, let's say sociology or something like that. And they would have like to have some courses that add add some kind of spice to their to their diplomas in, in, in this way. So you're, it, it, you, you can, of course, play with the exoticism exoticism label, label here in, in, in that sense. It's unavoidable in a sense, right? Um, so that, that would be one, that would be one reason. Um, I think earlier, um, I mean, traditionally, uh, considering the history of Sweden, uh, I mean, uh, it has been in our national interest to have uh, s some degree of professional knowledge about Russia, the Russian Empire. And what happens there? Because you know, for, for obvious reasons, it's a neighbor that we we should we, we should we have contacts with in various ways, and that we should we should know something about. Um, so, 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 so historically, you would have that factor as well. I would I would believe that 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 kind of thinking, unfortunately, is undermined with with this um, uh, transnational. Uh, you know, transnational tendencies in 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 education and so on, um, but but earlier at least it was there. Um, so generally, how how Swedes look at look at Ukraine, for example, it's difficult to say. I mean, if you go back thirty years, uh, not all Swedes would have heard of Ukraine at all. 
uh, then many of those who had heard of it would say that it's somewhere in Russia, right? Mm -hmm. Probably, I mean, I think it was one of the great accomplishments then of Ukrainian independence. You can say a lot of bad things about the effectiveness of state institutions in Ukraine and what has been done in the corruption and whatever you want, the usual things, you know. But but time in this, this sense works for Ukraine. Uh, as Ukraine participates in, in sport competition, music competitions, as people go themselves to Eastern Europe, to Ukraine, uh, I mean, as, uh, as long as a country produces, you know, stamps or what, whatever you want, then the country, or, and then the country participates in, in various contexts, then the fact of its existence gets established uh, little by little every day. You know? And you have, you know, exchange students from Ukraine who proudly represent Ukraine. And, and you know, so, so, so you, 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 you build subjectivity of this previously uh, not very subjective in Swedish eyes, uh, country, you know, every day. So I would say it's much better. It's, it's incomparably better than it was uh, not so long, not so long time ago. Uh, and you know, uh, people know that there is a war going on. People are um, uh, people are, are are would mainly, I think, automatically almost take 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 the, take the Ukrainian side. With the exceptions of you know the usual people you know um, very far right wingers or very far left wingers, right? You know yeah. what I find uh, uh, funny is uh, when this European football championship yeah. in Ukraine is playing because they are wearing uh, uh, blue and yellow uh, colors uh, t-shirts with uh, those colors. If I didn't look uh, at the name <laughs> of the national team. You could think oh, maybe it's Sweden that is playing. Yeah, but even Ukraine actually played against Sweden in the, in the latest championships. So yes, if you saw it, you were probably very confused. Yeah. <laughs> yeah which team is which? <laughs> yes. So wonderful. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nicholas, for you. Uh, such a, a vivid uh, and uh, uh, energetic uh, your sharing knowledge. Uh, because I know you, you wrote your dis doctoral dissertation in, in uh, Ukraine. Uh, what was the region that you were stationed there? Well, my, my dissertation is, 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 is not yet publicly defended, but it will be. Uh, and uh, it's about Bukovina, it's about uh, Chernivtsi, and it's about how people there uh, deal with the, uh, say, cultural diversity of the past and, and, and various attitudes to uh, to the multicultural past of, of, of this province. Yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Nicholas. And uh, dear our viewers, uh, uh, you you uh, just watched our program called Freely and Critically, conducted by Gentutas Mazeikis and me, Thomas Kowalowskas, senior researchers from Konas Vitotas Magnus University, Social and Political Critique Center. Once again, thank you to our special guest, Niklas Bertsand. Thank and you very much. We hope to meet nice you. Nice talking to you.